the B attitudes, I believe there's eight or nine of them. And today, um, today is my turn, and I had actually wanted to do three of them, but I just got down, I just got what past, I did, couldn't even get past the one that I had to do. And my, um, pa- last week, Pastor Sam spoke on the eternal blessings, that's Hour. I need I need my timer to come on. Um, the Beatitudes. Pastor Sam spoke on how God, on Matthew five, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for Him. Now we never we we. That's really a hard thing to. For I I really I hardly hear anyone say, "Well, I'm so blessed because I'm po- I'm blessed because I'm so poor." But if you were here last week, Pastor Sam told us that it's not about being poor, like financially, but it's when we're so, when our spirit man is uh, depleted, we can never be so wealthy in our spirit man that we don't need God. And I've been, I'm 55 years old, and I'm the poorest woman that, um, I think that, and I'm enjoying it because if I ever feel like I don't need God, um, that would be um, <clears throat> a big, my life would be miserable. And so I, I you know, we always want to bring, have a series. I'm going to take some time here, and if I don't finish, that's okay. We always want to have a series during Thanksgiving about the blessings and being grateful and being thankful. And is this table straight? Because it feels like it's tilted and it's really bothering me. And we always want to have, um, we always want to, the people always want to hear about that. And it's great to have blessings. It really is. It's great to, you know, have a nice car. It's great to be blessed with a nice house. It's great to be blessed with an amazing family. It's great to be blessed with fine, every area in, of your finances. All of those blessings are amazing. But um, there came a moment in Jesus, his life, where he realized where he, he only lived 33 years. And had Jesus needed a resume, his resume would have started when he was 12 years old because the word of God says that he was traveling with his family to a a festival and they traveled in this like entourage, like this group. They traveled by groups. And the word of God says that when in Matthew, uh, no, I'm sorry, um, I didn't write that note down. But the word of God says in one of the gospels that when Jesus, when his parents were left the festival and they were almost halfway home, they realized that Jesus, they didn't see Jesus as a 12 year old with them. And they just figured that he was amongst the relatives or amongst the the group. And when they realized that he wasn't with anyone, Um, that he had gotten left behind. Well, he didn't get left behind. They went back to the festival, and where did they find Jesus? In the church, in the temple, in the synagogue. And what was he doing? He was teaching. He was actually sitting with the teachers, and he was asking so many questions, and they they were amazed. The teachers were amazed at the questions that he was asking. And I don't know if you've ever been left behind. Anybody here ever been left behind? (laughs) One person, two. So y'all know where liars go, right? (laughs) I'm just saying. Anybody been left behind here? Oh, more hands going up. (laughs) Thank you for your honesty. So um, where was I? Oh, left behind. When I, when, when I was a young girl, um, my parents, I've been born and raised in church, literally. And, and one of the churches that my dad pastored, pastored a small church in Alice, Texas. And I remember, um, it, I think it was like a 
a Christmas uh, play or something. No, it couldn't have been a Christmas play, but it was something. And I fell asleep on the bench. And I remember that my parents went home and they came back for me and I was still asleep on the bench. <laughs> So it feel it really that I I got left behind because I fell asleep. But Jesus got left behind because he was involved in in an adult conversation here. But he already knew. Did he know at 12 years old? Did he know that the, why the Lord had sent him? I mean, he only lived 33 years. His resume started when he was 12, already teaching, already wanting to know, already in the temple. And he really couldn't start his ministry till he was 30. 30, that, that was the prophetic word. But so we see back to the Beatitudes um, <clears throat> in Matthew 4. That's not where I'm starting, but, you know, I always like to go back. as reference and the word of God says in Matthew 4 that Jesus this is in Matthew 4 where he began to where he began to draw all the crowds all the crowds and he began to heal every sickness and every disease and he began to free people and he realized in chapter 5 this is where we start the sermon on the mount it says that one day as the as he saw the crowds gathering, it says that Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down, and he and his disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. Just so simple, verse one. But there's so much in there's so much information right there because it says one day as he saw the crowds gathering. One day, as he saw, he wasn't so preoccupied. Hey, John and Peter, how many people showed up? What's the count? How many people did we heal? How many people got saved? How many? No, no, no. It just says that one day, as he saw the crowd, the crowds gathering, that he decided to go up instead of go out to the green room where the musicians like to go. It says that he saw the crowds and he, and he went up to the mountainside and sat down and the disciples followed. And <clears throat> I like to start with that because I always like to, I always like to, um, give y'all the setting of where the scriptures come from. What, what started the Beatitudes? Well, I really believe that Jesus, that when he had been with the Father, before the Father sent him through the Virgin to be born, when he had had those conversations with the Father, seated by the Father on the throne, I believe that the Lord had been, that God the Father had been telling him, of the mission that Jesus would complete and the vision. What is the vision? The vision was what God saw. We're here because of what someone visioned about this church, and it's our job to complete the mission. I'm here because there was a visionary here And I'm just here to complete the mission. And I believe that Jesus had, what an honor for him to have that conversation with the Father. And the Father say, man, my creation, my children, my people, they're they're so messed up. And the day that I send you, I need you to tell them this. But it's okay that we gather them first from fits through miracles, through healing. But what happens when they get healed of a broken leg and next month they break the other leg? What happens when I heal them from leprosy and they go to the river, they go to the priest and they're healed and then they go back to their sin and the leprosy comes back? What happens there, there, and you, and you, you're only going to be on earth. He's telling Jesus at the right hand, you're only going to be there 33 years. And I'm only going to allow you to be in ministry three years. So my, your mission, 
You need to see my vision to complete your mission. And what an honor that the, that the father shared that with his son. And in uh, Luke, um, so that was where the Jesus was 12 years old. I got ahead of myself. But Jesus, he came with a mission plan. And through the vision of what the father saw, that's why he sent his son. The father's heart was longing to heal his people, but he also wanted to make his people their etern- the, um, heaven. He wanted to make, give heaven, give them an eternal home. He's just not here to heal us, but there's a place that we have to go to. There's more than the blessings of the home, a physical blessing, a healing. Like I said, a family, whatever your, your prayer list is for. I wonder if it's any of what the Beatitudes to change out. It could be to change our spiritual life. And here Jesus saw through the eyes of love. Someone once told me that, um, that the Father, that when we get to heaven, we're going to know all our, all our whys, all our questions are going to be answered immediately because we're going to see through the eyes of Jesus, which his eyes only see love. He didn't see your sin when he was dying on the cross. He saw love. He said, I'm doing this for the Father because you belong to a creator. And I'm here, I'm doing this to restore you to bring you back to him so that your eternal soul will go to an eternal place, heaven or hell. But I'm here, I'm doing this so that you can be in an eternal place with me and the Father. Jesus saw through the eyes of love. And so he came to give us these eternal blessings. And The title of my message, I have two titles. Take whichever one you want. But it's okay to cry. It really is. And the other title is Real Men Cry. I don't know why the Lord gave me those two. But Matthew 5, 4 says, God blesses those who mourn. And this is our scripture. This is where I'm going to be speaking from. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. A lot of preachings, a lot of teachings, um, <clears throat> do they, um, they reference their teaching on that word mourn as like you, when you lose someone. But the Beatitudes are not about... Um, the Beatitudes are to help us spiritually. It's the attitude that needs to change within us. Because again, the Lord was healing people, but again, once they were healed and needed more healings, and it was like, Jesus didn't just come to heal. He came to save. He came to restore. He came to redeem us back to the Father. And so the Beatitudes are, this is where Jesus said, if you watched the video last week where Jesus tells Matthew, he says, this is the roadmap to me, to the Father. This is how you need to live. Those um, blessed are the pure, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you notice, every, it doesn't say, blessed are those who get a new car for they can get to freedom life on time. Nothing is, is a tangible here. Everything is a spiritual uh, need for our body, for our spiritual life, I'm sorry. And here the word mourn, the word mourn is blessed are those who mourn. Those who mourn, this is a tough one, but it comes from the Amplified. <clears throat> and I always go back to 
uh, the harder translations that we, we don't want to talk about the these and the thous, but whenever you don't understand, whenever it's just, it sounds so good, and the, like the message is very clear, but in, in the, if you go back to the original translations, the word mourn here means when you have, when you're mourning your sin. I know that's a hard one because I know we want to hear, well, I've mourned a lot of the loss of a loved one. And that will always be my go-to, mourning the loss of a loved one. Nothing else matters. I could mourn. I don't care about losing a house. I don't care about losing my car. I don't care about losing anything else. But when you lose a loved one, you th- like that's the go-to scripture. But that's so convenient for me because I know the Lord's going to comfort me. But here he's talking about my attitude. And my attitude, the, the, my sinful nature keeps me from the eternal blessings. My sinful nature. And it says that um, Jesus Um, in John 11, 32, that Jesus wept, going back to weeping. See, because when we mourn, when we're thinking about our sin or bad choices or whatever you want to, whatever is pleasing to to your spirit, but be careful with the words that are pleasing to your spirit. Be careful with those words because they... They keep us in a comfort zone. But here, it's really our sinful nature. And when we're remorseful of when we mourn our bad decisions, our sinful choices, our sinful nature, the Lord says that he will bless us when, when, we, when we are so... <clears throat> um, When, when our, when our um, choices keep us from the Lord, when our choices uh, bring us shame, when our choices... I have sinned against the Lord. I'm so grateful that I, he's telling me to mourn about it. Instead of going and hiding, instead of hiding, what do I do? I come here, literally. If I can't, it's in my bedroom. It's in my bathroom where my kids can't hear me. But I'm mourning and saying, Lord, I know this has, was not pleasing unto you. Help me to be like David, a man of God, after your heart, after your heart. And it's okay to mourn. That's why the Lord gave me that title, real men. And I'm talking about men and women, because women can be stubborn too. Women can be, um, somebody just made a face at their wife. Women can be, like, hard to stubborn. Oh, really? Okay, I got more on men's stuff right here. But Jesus was a real man. And the word of God says in John eleven thirty two, 32, it says that when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, this is when uh, Lazarus had died, and it says she, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. But then it says, then Jesus saw her weeping.
applies to me. It's God's going to bless me because I've mourned. No, that's not where this scripture is taking us. Choices that lead us to shame and guilt. That's what this scripture is about. Choices that move us away from God. Can you just think about where you were in the beginning of the year? Just think about that, how close you were to God. Was your resolution to say, Lord, I'm going to be here every service on time. I'm going to serve. I'm going to join this ministry. And where are you today? Where are we today? We're about six weeks away from a new year. Where have you been in 2023? Where have we been? Where have I been? Choices that make us isolate ourselves from him, more importantly. Believe me, I've made wrong choices this year. And I know when I've disappointed God because my choices have brought me down. I feel unworthy. This is what a bad choice does to us. This is hearing the enemy say, do it. It's okay. And the moment I do it, the moment I say it, the moment I look at it, I feel unworthy. I feel regret. I feel unloved. But I'm here to tell you that God's love is unfailing, is unwavering, and is unending. God's love is the, the epitome of comfort in all its essence. When we mourn, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I believe when I mourn, I believe when you mourn, God's not going to wrap his arms around you. Hmm. I believe he already has his arms around you, and he's comforting you more, tighter, closer, closer. <sighs> I want to talk real quickly about a man that um, dishonored God, that was that made a few choices um, that pulled him away from um, maybe his calling, maybe his anointing. Um, Pastor Sam spoke about him last week. King David was a great man. I know some of y'all thought I was going to call out another pastor. I'm just calling out what's in the Bible. There's good novellas in here. Read them. King David was a great man, he, and he was anointed uh, to be king. When was he anointed to be king? As a shepherd boy. Oh, I got some good students in here. Um, when he became king over Israel, he did great things, but he also did things that greatly hurt God. And even though the Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart, that's what the Lord, when he called him out, he's the, the, the scripture says that God was looking, after, looking for someone that would have a heart after God, have a heart like God. Day, but David was not perfect. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we find the story of David and Bathsheba. This is the, the only story I'm going to go to. And we all know the story of David and Bathsheba. Um, I love what Jensen Franklin says. He, he was preaching on David and Bathsheba a few months ago, and he said, she probably had a sister named Jacuzzi. <laughs> Go back and hear that sermon. It's really good. But his eyes were on this beautiful woman <clears throat> that belonged to someone else. Do we all know the story? Most of us, okay. And it says in 2 Samuel 11, 1, in the spring of the year, I'm telling you, verse 1, every chapter, you guys got to pay attention. In the spring of the year, <clears throat> when kings normally go out to war, how many kings do we have in here? 
when kings normally go out to war. David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. Hmm, when the kings go out, yet David sent them out. It says they destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Reba. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. While his army was out in battle, David stayed behind. Was David a king? Did he belong with the other kings? But the word of God says that he stayed behind. And because he had, his, because he had time on his hand, instead of a shield and a sword or an ink, to write a battle plan, an ink pen, the Bible says in verse 2, late one afternoon, after his midday rest, oh, I'm so glad my king had his nap, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. And as he looked out over the city, over the city, it says, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Now, that's really interesting there. As he looked over the city, I mean, did David have binoculars? <laughs> over the city, come on. He just didn't look over to his neighbor or across the street, but it says he was looking over the city. See what happens when you call yourself a king and you're not out at war with the others. You have too much time on your hand. And this rooftop moment caused not only Bathsheba to mourn the loss of her husband, but David to mourn as well. That timer is stuck. I've been on 959. Sorry. I don't want to keep you all longer, and I'm enjoying myself over here. I got one minute. <laughs> so this rooftop moment, how many of y'all have ever been in a rooftop moment? You should be somewhere, and you're in a rooftop moment. You should be with your your friends or your colleagues at a whatever men's conference, prayer conference, morning or doing something and you're you say no oh I have zero minutes and you have your you decide to wake up from your nap whatever time you want and get on the rooftop it says that he got Uriah's wife pregnant the word of God says he wanted her so bad that he called her in he had her brought to him, and he got her pregnant, Uriah's wife. And who was Uriah? Uriah was one of his top um, officials. And, and he, um, he took his wife while Uriah was out in battle. And it says that he got her pregnant. And when she came and told him that she was, when she sent word that she was pregnant, he, tried, he called Uriah back from battle <clears throat> and tried to get him to sleep with his wife. But Uriah was so dedicated to the battle, the war, the vision, yes, to complete a mission. And so David tried to cover his sin but it didn't work. Plan A didn't work. So he put a plan B into action, and he had Uriah, he had Joab put Uriah at the front line of the battle, at the front lines where it was the goriest. And I believe that Uriah would have survived, but what did David tell Joab to do? Put take him there and then like walk away from it so he doesn't have your your back and that's what Joab did so Uriah was killed 
So the morning, the sin, David's sinful desire caused Bathsheba to mourn, brought mourning to her because now she lost her husband. And then <clears throat> David, they would lose, the Lord would punish them by their son dying, by killing their son. This rooftop moment led to an innocent life, led to killing an innocent life to cover his shame. He used an innocent man to cover his own shame. David, David, the shepherd boy, David, the giant killer, this day, are we talking about the same David pastor? Yes. The great musician, David, not this David, but this David, yes, this David, this David, the author of the Psalms, the author of the Psalms, he mourned, and he, a lot, many of his Psalms, I just want to go over a few, just over a few words, because we, we want to, our first go-to Psalm is what? Our first go-to psalm is the 23rd. Yes. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's our first go-to. Psalm 100. Uh, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Psalm 119. You created me in my mother's womb. But we don't we don't realize that the first uh, section, the first chapters of the Psalms, David had so much remorse for what he had done. He didn't, he didn't just write the most beautiful ones right away. He was honest. His, his sin, he mourned his sin. He was so remorseful. He was so repentant. And he would tell the Lord, <clears throat> oh, Lord, I have so many enemies. God, will you, will you rescue me? Lord, are you, are you, put a shield around me. He was so, answer me when I call you, Lord. Oh, Lord, hear me as I pray. Pay attention to my groaning. Listen to my cry. Oh, Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger or discipline. Oh, Lord, I come to you for protection. Well, the Lord had already given him protection, and he just goes on and on with the remorse. If you read through the, the first chapters, David is so remorseful. His journals, he penned, Lord, please help me. Will you judge me forever? Oh, Lord, why? Why do you stand so far away? He even felt that the Lord had pulled away from him. And he says, why do you hide when I'm in trouble? This is the desperation of a man that sinned. Lord, I trust in you for protection. Where are you? Lord, help me. For the godly are fast disappearing. Lord, where are you? How long will you forget about me? See, when we don't mourn the bad choices we've made, our sinful choices, this is what we will sound like. We, it will, our prayers will begin to sound like, where are you, Lord? When all along, he's right there. He hasn't moved. The word of God says, if you, he says, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you, but I'm never going to move from here. We will always move. Our sin will pull us away from God, but he'll always be right there. But that's why his word said, when you draw near to me, you're always going to feel like you're getting closer to the Lord because he hasn't moved. And then he wrote the beautiful Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd and I have all that I need. He lets me rest in the green meadows. How long 
did it take for him to finally have this peace that he could write this beautiful psalm that's, writ that's heard throughout uh, weddings, funerals, he, and he says, he leads me beside the peaceful stream, streams, and it says he renews my strength and he guides me do, along right paths, bringing honor to his name. And then he says, when I walk through the valley, through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close to me, your rod and your, your staff comfort me and protect me. And to be protected and comforted by God's rod and staff meant that David had to return and get closer to the Lord with remorse. To mourn is to be, to mourn is to be remorseful of our sin and to feel a sadness when we've offended God, to feel like, Lord, I can't start my day without asking you for forgiveness and perhaps the next day, you're going to have to ask him again because it was so great, because it was so deep. God wants to give us all his eternal blessings. He wants to give us beauty for the ashes and joy for our mourning. Isaiah 61, 1 and 3 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me. This is Isaiah, but he's talking about the Lord. This is a prophetic word for Jesus. And it says that the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. This would be Jesus in, cha in Matthew chapter 4, bringing good news to the poor. Good news to the poor. The Beatitudes, he's speaking it in Isaiah. And he says, he has sent me to comfort. To comfort to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim the captives to be released and prisoners to be free. He has sent me to tell those who mourn he's going to comfort and now he's sending me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor, the favor has come. Who would have ever thought if I mourn that favor can be upon me? I mean, have your children ever, have you ever, my chil I'll, I'll speak of my children when they disappoint me and when, when, when I can, as, an, as, an, uh, as adult children, when, when I reconcile with them, guess what? Favor, I give them favor. They've opened doors that I had shut, but when they come and say, Mom, I was wrong, and I can say, I was wrong too, but you were more wrong. <laughs> and when there's reconciliation, there's favor. You just never know who's going to have a fancy dinner with me. Favor. How many of you need the Lord's favor this morning? And it says, and with it, the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes. A joyous blessing, an eternal blessing, it says, instead of mourning. Instead of your mourning, he's going to give you an eternal blessing. A festive praise instead of despair. Another translation says he will give us garments of praise. So we, will, we can have a crown instead of the ashes. He wants to give us a crown, and he wants to give us um, garments of praise. Another translation says that these garments are just like so colorful so that others will know, wow, she's been restored. She's been forgiven. He's been crowned with joy. I mean, how many, how many people love seeing a beautiful smile on someone when someone carries the spirit of joy? You know why they carry the spirit of joy? It's called forgiveness because they've reconciled. They've made things right with God. And it says, I'm out of time. Go ahead, let's go ahead and stand. It says this in their righteousness because when we ask for forgiveness, 
there's we live in righteousness. It says they will look like, how many of you want to look like something when, we, when you've been forgiven? You don't want to look like the ashes. <clears throat> it says we will look like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his glory. For his glory. I believe that the Lord is calling us to more than the miracles, not just the miracles, not just the healing, because, I mean, I thought I could never get sick again after I had COVID and double pneumonia, and here I am, eight weeks later, bronchitis, pneumonia, and still have a horrible, wheezy laugh. Don't make me laugh. <sighs> And if I just relied on the Lord for my healing and for the blessings of the materialistic things, I'd be so empty. I would. And that's why I'm glad that, I, that he has called me, that he can bless me while I mourn, because then I know he's going to comfort me. That is why I'm grateful that he will bless the, those that are poor in spirit. And we're going to go on through the rest of them. But sometimes it's just like one, you just need to, I told Sam, can you do two or three of them? And now I realize why he just did one, because it's just so deep. Because it's so easy to be healed of, of a wound, but an eternal wound. It takes time. It takes time to forgive. It takes time to release the bitterness. Because you can forgive an ex today, right now. But tonight, when they do you wrong, the bitterness comes back. It's so easy, and that's where the Lord wants to heal us, from the inside out. That's why he said, I'm looking for someone that will worship me in spirit and, and in truth. Come on, let's be true about it. I can't, God can't look at you if you're worshiping in a false, like you have it all together. God wants us to worship in truth, in truth. I was going to end with another amazing scripture here about Daniel. I, d I really don't know how I can apply it to this. But it says that Daniel... That Daniel... He set himself apart, and he wanted to be used by God, and God used him greatly through visions to, um, to uh, translate visions and dreams to the king. But because he had set himself apart, and it says, so I turned to the Lord God and pleaded to him, to him in prayer and fasting, and, and it says, and I also wore a, a, a burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. And then it says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. See, we want the blessings, but this is what God is asking us asking of us to those he will give he will fulfill the promises of his unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands and it says but we have sinned and done wrong and we have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations and Daniel he fast he he prayed and he fasted and he sprinkled ashes on himself 
But then it says, but I pray to the Lord and confessed. I pray to the Lord and confess. Can I just read this and then we could go into a worship song?